Chapter Twenty Seven of the Money Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Money Moon, a Romance by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter Twenty Seven, in which is verified the adage of the cup and the lip. Now, as he sat thus plunged in thought, he heard the voice of one who approached intoning a familiar chant or refrain. The voice was harsh, albeit not unmusical, and the words of the chant were these. When I am dead, diddle diddle, as well may hap, bury me deep, diddle diddle, under the tap, under the tap, diddle diddle, I'll tell you, Lord! exclaimed the singer, breaking off suddenly, be that you, Mr. Bellew, sir? Yea, in good sooth, Adam, the very same. But you sing, Adam? Ah, I sing, Mr. Bellew, sir, and if you ax me why, then I'll tell you because I'm happy hearted and full of J-O-Y joy, sir. The mortgage be paid off at last, Mr. Bellew, sir. Miss Anthea be out of debt, free, sir, and all along a Master Georgie. God bless him. Oh, said Bellew, er, that's good. Good? exclaimed Adam. Ah, oh, Mr. Bellow, sir, it be more than good. It saved Miss Anthea's home for her, and betwixt you and me, sir, I think it saved her, too. And it be all along of that Master Georgie. Lord, sir, many's the time I've watched that there blessed boy a-seekin' and a-searchin', a-pokin' and a-pryin' round the place, a-lookin' for his fortune. But, Lord, bless my eyes and limbs, sir, I never thought as he'd find nothin'. <laughs> Why, of course not, Adam. Ah, but— that's just where I mistook, Mr. Bellow, sir, because he did. Did what, Adam? Found the fortune as he were always a-looking for. A sack of golden sovereigns, sir. And bank-notes, Mr. Bellow, sir. Bushels on em. Enough. Ha! <laughs> More and enough to pay off that mortgage, and to send that dear old Grimes about his business, and away from Dapplemere for good and all, sir. Oh, so Grimes is really paid off, then, is he, Adam? I done it myself, sir, with these here two ands. Three thousand pound I counted over to him, and five hundred more in banknotes, sir, while Miss Anthea sat by like one in a dream. Altogether there were five thousand pound as that blessed boy dug up out of the orchard, done up all in a potato sack, under this very identical tree as you'm a settin' under, Mr. Bellew, sir. Ecod, I'd be half-minded to take a shovel and have a try at fortune hunting myself. Only there ain't much chance of finding another hereabouts. <laughs> Besides, the boy prayed for that fortune— a oh, long and hard he prayed, Mr. Bellew, sir. And twixt you and me, sir, I ain't been much of a prayer myself since my old mother died. Anyhow, the mortgage be paid off, sir. Miss Arthay is free, and tis joyful and happy hearted I be this night. Prudence and me'll be getting married soon now, and when I think of her cooking, <laughs> Lord, Mr. Bellew, sir, all as I say is God bless Master Georgie. <laughs> Good night, sir, and may your dreams be as happy as mine. Always supposing I do dream, which uh, is seldom. Good night, sir. Long after Adam's cheery whistle had died away, Bellew sat, pipe in mouth, staring up at the moon. At length, however, he rose and turned his steps towards the house. Mr. Bellew, he started, and turning, saw Anthea standing amid her roses. For a moment they looked upon each other in silence, as though each dreaded to speak. Then suddenly she turned, and broke a great rose from its stem, and stood twisting it between her fingers. "'Why did you do it?' she asked. "'Do it?' he repeated. "'I mean the fortune. Georgie told me how you helped him to find it, and I know how it came there, of course. Why did you do it?' "'You didn't tell him how it came there asked bellew anxiously no she answered i think it would break his heart if he knew and i think it would have broken his heart if he had never found it said bellew and i couldn't let that happen could i anthea did not answer and he saw that her eyes were very bright in the shadow of her lashes though she kept them lowered to the rose in her fingers anthea said he suddenly and reached out his hand to her but she started, and drew from his touch. "'Don't,' she said, speaking almost in a whisper, "'don't touch me. Oh, 
I know you have paid off the mortgage. You have bought back my home for me as you bought back my furniture. Why? Why? I was nothing to you or you to me. Why have you laid me under this obligation? You know I can never hope to return your money. Oh, why? Why did you do it? Because I love you, Aunt Thea, have loved you from the first, because everything I possess in the world is yours, even as I am. You forget, she broke in proudly, you forget everything but my love for you, Aunt Thea, everything but that I want you for my wife. I'm not much of a fellow, I know, but could you learn to love me enough to marry me some day aunt thea would you have dared to say this to me before to-night before your money had bought back the roof over my head oh haven't i been humiliated enough you you have taken from me the only thing i had left my independence stolen it from me oh hadn't i been shamed enough now as she spoke she saw that his eyes were grown suddenly big and fierce and at that moment her hands were caught in his powerful clasp let me go she cried no said he shaking his head not until you tell me if you love me speak anthea loose my hands she threw up her head proudly and her eyes gleamed and her cheeks flamed with sudden anger loose me she repeated but Bellew only shook his head, and his chin seemed rather more prominent than usual, as he answered, "'Tell me that you love me, or that you hate me, whichever it is, but until you do, you hurt me,' said she, and then, as his fingers relaxed, with a sudden passionate cry, she had broken free, but even so he had caught and swept her up in his arms, and held her close against his breast." And now, feeling the hopelessness of further struggle, she lay passive, while her eyes flamed up into his, and his eyes looked down into hers. Her long, thick hair had come loose, and now, with a sudden quick gesture, she drew it across her face, veiling it from him. Wherefore he stooped his head above those lustrous tresses. Anthea, he murmured, and the masterful voice was strangely hesitating and the masterful arms about her were wonderfully gentle. Aunt Thea, do you love me? Lower he bent, and lower, until his lips touched her hair, until beneath that fragrant veil his mouth sought and found hers. And in that breathless moment he felt them quiver responsive to his caress. And then he had set her down, she was free, and he was looking at her with a new-found radiance in his eyes. "'Aunt Thea,' he said, wonderingly, "'why, then, you do?' But as he spoke she hid her face in her hands. "'Aunt Thea,' he repeated. "'Oh,' she whispered, "'I hate you, despise you. Oh, you shall be paid back every penny, every farthing.' And very soon, next week, I marry Mr. Cassilis. And so she turned and fled away, and left him standing there amid the roses. End of chapter 27